Hi everyone and welcome to today's session which is a look at quantum and deep technology innovation in Bristol. My name is Kim and I'm a programme manager for research and innovation at the University of Bristol and the centre manager of the Quantum Technology Enterprise Centre. We've got a jam-packed session for you today starting with an introduction to the commercialisation of research from Dr Andy Collins then we'll be joined on stage by three founders from local tech companies who will give us a brief overview of the highs and lows of founding a technology startup company. After that, we've got a panel session discussing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Bristol before our exciting introduction to the Quantum Technology Innovation Centre. We really want this event to be as interactive as possible, so you can react throughout the session by sending us a thumbs up or a smiley face by clicking the emoji button at the bottom of your screen. Or if you have a question, you can either pop it in the chat box on the right hand sidebar or during the Q&A sessions, we'll be inviting some of the audience to the stage to ask their questions live. And you can get involved in this by clicking the raise the hand button at the bottom of the screen. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to Andy, who will be kicking off this session by telling us more about the road to commercialisation. Great. Thanks, Kim. And um, please give a thumbs up if you can hear me OK. That would be really good. OK, great. Just checking. Fantastic. So I'll be very quick. Um, a bit of my background, as Kim's already mentioned, I'm involved with the Quantum Technology Enterprise Centre. And so part of what we've been doing over the last four years is helping people who want to develop their ideas and turn them into companies. And these are quantum based companies or quantum inspired quantum engineering, but also engineering and bioscience companies as well. So we've had as a team quite a good overview of the deep tech community and how to take these things out of the lab and into the commercial sector. So I just want to give you a really quick overview of what it's like to be an entrepreneur in this particular space uh, and how you make that transition and focus on one particular journey for one of our fellows. But something I want to start with, and if you remember only one thing from this, is that you're not doing this alone. Many of the people we work with have incredible skill sets in the scientific area and indeed are world experts in what they're doing. But no one person can know it all. And if you're embarking on something like the road to commercialization, you're looking at patenting something, you're looking at getting finance, don't do it alone. Find a mentor. Find someone who has done that journey before and can advise you on what the pitfalls might be. So this is Zhao, Zhao Ai. And he is also known previously as, as Ross uh, and, and still is in some quarters. He was a, uh, a PhD and a postdoc at the uh, Quantum Engineering Technology Labs at the University of Bristol. And he left to get a job in the commercial sector. When we started our programme in 2016 back at the University of Bristol, Zhao applied for one of our QTech fellowships. Now, just to give you some background, this is a year long funded fellowship that allows people to build their ideas and turn them into companies. And the entire idea of that program was to give people the funding, the training, and the contacts to be able to build their own business. It wasn't anything like an MBA, everything was a live hands-on exercise. So they got trained in market research, they got trained in how to um, manage their books, how to look at the finances, looking at IP, IP strategy. All of these things were done practically with a view to meeting investors near the end of that year and gaining funding, but near nine months into the program. So at year zero, Zhao wanted to join us because he'd seen a friend of his uh, get a company off the ground and receive insane amounts of investment, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if memory serves me correctly, and, and really make a good go of it. And so Zhao wanted that for himself. So he had a really good idea um, that was based on a technology he would published before about looking at CO2 or uh, sorry, looking at carbon monoxide and being able to detect it in the atmosphere using a particular way of modulating laser lights and detecting photons bouncing back. Uh, essentially a, a LIDAR. Um, and he wanted to start the company QLM. So that, that's the new logo. It went through a few brand revisions, but basically that's that's how Zhao started out. And so year zero, he joined us. And what does that mean? So you've got the idea and the basic plan on the left hand side there. You can see the idea and the basic plan is all you need to start out with. But you're going to have to think about something 
uh, in that first column, ownership, funding, and legalities. So what does that mean? It means that first and foremost, you should protect your idea. Your idea or your intellectual property is what your company is going to be founded on. And it's important that no one else can copy you or copy that idea because otherwise they can make a business out of it. And why would someone invest money in you or invest time when everyone else is going to be doing this? So it's really important in the technical area to protect your idea. This means don't talk about it. If you're a scientist, don't publish anything about it until you've uh, talked to either your technology transfer office or whoever's been paying for your research to talk about patenting it and protecting it. Because the moment you've published that, it's out there and it's gone and you won't be able to, to publish it. I've actually seen a patent that's been turned down because one of the inventors talked about a potential use case for their, uh, it was a, basically a protein-based uh, solution, uh, sorry, a liquid protein melt that could have been used for a application and just because they put that in one free giveaway leaflet that they took to a conference or a few published leaflets they lost the protection on it so be really careful about who you talk to your idea about also your market research you may think it's a fabulous idea but again and again other people may not see it that way and they won't be willing to invest you might have a wonderful widget and the science behind it might be incredible. But if there's not actually the market there, that is to say people who are going to buy it, it's not going to take off as a business concern. So what can you do? So various tools are available to help you do this. One of the, the most common is called the, the business model canvas. You can Google that, you'll come up with many. One of the more recent ones that's been used and certainly is backed by Innovate UK, which is a government body that funds this kind of early stage research, is the innovation canvas. And this is quite a useful tool where you, you actually put down where you're at put who your customers are, who the leadership is. So it's worth having a look at some of these tools before you think about moving your idea forward. So you actually see and spot where the gaps are in your expertise. Again, you're not going to do this alone. So you need to know where you're going to need help. And something that comes up again and again, I don't want to give anyone the impression that starting a tech company is going to be super easy because it's not, um, but it doesn't have to be super hard either and one of the things that gets hotly contested is when you're starting to divvy up the pie and the value of the company and so this is a phrase that's often used it's been, been coined by kim our, our host today as well we're all friends until we're not you might have a wonderful working relationship with the people that you're co-developing with at the moment you might have a great relationship with your founders but you be, need to be clear from the beginning who is doing what what the roles are and particularly what those rewards are going to be and there's various ways to to divvy that up so we get to ownership, funding, legal. Who does what? Where are you going to get your money from? Well, that's difficult. In Zhao's case, he was part of the QTech program. And so there was some early stage seed funding. There are also schemes going. There are grants available. I would recommend that you talk to people like Set Squared, Engine Shed, Unit DX, all in the local vicinity. This is just Bristol at the moment, but there's many places like that or or places that can offer you uh, help in where you find your seed stage funding. So talk to your university. If you're based at a university, they will have a tech transfer office that can help you uh, talk through some of those stages. In Zhao's case, he was working with John Rarity, one of the professors here who heads up, uh, who's the director of the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs, as it's known now. And so John was Zhao's former supervisor. And together, they started to work on developing this technology for detecting methane gas. Now, why methane? Well, methane is a big problem in the oil and gas industry. Methane leaks can cause explosions. And so they thought there was a good idea to take this forward and actually develop the idea of a, a laser that can detect methane leaks at range. That is to say, instead of having to go around with a sniffer, which is what they call it in the business, that can detect the methane gas using a little squidgy rubber ball, that takes ages and it's, it's very intensive labor wise. What they were going to do was just fire a laser, sweep it across the, the area, maybe even stick it on a drone, and they'd be able to detect methane leaks instantly. And one of the things you need to be aware of is how you're pitching your idea as well. So this is one of the early pitches that Zhao gave about his technology. Science is great, absolutely brilliant. Oh, there's graphs there. Physicists love graphs, so absolutely perfect. But does it tell you what the thing actually does? Why am I buying this? What is this? What uh, is there a laser involved? Over on the right hand side of that, you can actually see that small nodule sticking out is the drone that they envisage sticking it on. And so that's meant to be the concept drawing of the drone. So what we helped Zhao with was refining this value proposition, as it's called, into, well, what are, what are, 
the end user is going to care about. Why are they going to give you money? Why are they going to buy this? And this got refined all down into one slide. Basically, $2 billion in fines for a gas company that failed to detect methane leaks and a village blew up. And this happens all the time. The value to them is not so much being able to detect these methane leaks in time. It's protecting themselves from the cost of having to put things right when they have a methane leak that goes disastrously wrong. So when you're thinking about your idea and how you pitch it and how you take it forward, think about the science, how it can be applied. That is very relevant. That will inform you on how big it is, how small it is, what the power requirements, they call it swap, size, weight and power. But also, why does the end user want it? What's in it for them? How does it help them? So year one, they started applying for Innovate UK grants together. Now, this is where you get a collaborative uh, consortium together. You don't always need a, a collaboration, but in the quantum, you know, the UK National Quantum Technology Programme, there was something, uh, there were four waves or are four waves of funding available to help early stage quantum companies get off the ground. And so in wave one of these funding calls, Zhao put in an application that was a collaboration between himself, Sky Futures Partners, who make drones, and the University of Bristol. And you'll see it's not a, it, it's quite a significant sum of money. Always keep in mind that if you're working with hardware or some kind of technology, you'll need more money than you think you do, much more. But this got off the ground and they built a preliminary drone and did some flight tests with it. When they got talking to the customers, though, they discovered that the customers don't necessarily want to fly over oil fields. Maybe they just want a static camera that looks in place. We get to year two. They completed their Innovate UK um, bid uh, or, or project, rather, in a collaboration. They have results. During that time, they've refined the product. They've made things smaller, small enough to, to hang on a drone. They started looking at their marketing. That is to say they've got the company livery and things like that. Now they need experience. I mentioned earlier, you need help to do this. And so on the left hand side, we've got Murray Reed, who is now the CEO. If you start your company, you don't necessarily have to be the chief executive officer, which is what that means. They're called C-suite, the, the chief executives. Murray comes from or had a background in Silicon Valley and Guchin Hausko, which is a, a major optoelectronics supplier. And when you bring on board a CEO, it's not just someone who's good at business, although that's definitely something you need. You need someone who's got the contacts, the experience in that industry. And so Zhao now owns part of that company, but also he's got someone else doing the really hard business stuff for him. He's done that, what you call the first mile. He's got things off the ground, and now you start to bring in team members who can help you. Yuri Anderson has a background in fintech. He's also very big on the quantum scene and has a good understanding of quantum technology in the funding landscape there and successfully um, raised a number of companies. And you can see his, his very short bio on there as well. So now Zhao is a team of four people just within year two, all doing things, all reaching out, all adding to the, the program. Then you start to need to hire engineers. So on the right hand side there, that's James Titchener. He's also a former QTech fellow himself. So he's well up on his quantum technology. And both him and Zhao are working very hard on the technology side of things. You can see that they had a professional company photo shoot and they have a web presence now. So I highly recommend you go and see their Twitter feed if you want to see a live real time story of how a company is, has grown. Year two, they've got their money. They're starting to recruit people. They're starting to get investment as well. One of the skills you're going to have to learn is pitching. This is Yuri pitching to investors to talk about QLM. Note they've got the, the new branding there. Uh, if you actually watch this talk in real time, it's a really cool video of the drones flying over the top. You've got to have that excitement factor. You will learn lots of different skills that you didn't have before. Pitching, finance, business development. You'll also have to pivot your product. You'll have to listen to your customers, listen to the people who are actually paying you, and transform what you're building. On the left-hand side is a prototype of the static camera. Remember, they wanted a drone first, then they said, nope, we kind of want something static that can just look there. And on the right-hand side, you can see the camera that it's eventually going to be. Why a camera? Well, the fittings, the mounts, all of these things already exist for security cameras. So it makes sense to piggyback your technology on the top of that. So it's easy to implement for the people who have to buy this equipment already. You're not buying a drone system. You're not buying a new thing that needs difficulty fitting. You're just buying a another camera that can slot into what you've already got in terms of your infrastructure. And that's the importance of listening to your customer, and really doing your market research before you get into something. So you don't spend money going down the wrong direction. And this is the thing in action. So just if you didn't have a good idea before, it's basically a camera 
that can look at methane leaking out of tanks in real time. And they've since gone on to obtain lots more funding to be able to support these activities and build a larger team. So now we get to the team, we get to the delivering and doing, we actually get to protection and contracts. How are you going to sell this product? Well, they've got a business development manager on board now, and they've also got a lot of partners as well. There's lots of grants available. If you're working in high technology, if you can get a grant or some kind of funding, this is called the Splice Project, you can see how many partners are involved in this. All of them are learning something about this. All of them are getting something out of this. And it it all helps you build your individually your businesses. So I, I can't recommend getting involved in grants enough. So here at year three, we can see that the team has grown. We see a few new faces in the lineup there, an extra engineer in the form of George Harrison. Dominic Keane is one of the investors who's come on board as well. You need that financial knowledge. You need someone who can look at your books and make sure things are okay. Uh, and we've got Pete Sterling as well. He's involved with STL Technology, uh, and he's also doing business development for them. And then just a short hop later to year four, we start to see new faces again. We see Doug Millington Smith the applications manager. So Doug's out there talking to people. We see another engineer because they're starting to build things. We've actually got a head of engineering in Alex Stone. So lots of people, and you really start to see this effect where you need more and more money to support the staff, but the company grows along with that. And so what I want to leave you with is that it can be really hard just to begin with when it's just you, but you're not going to do this alone. If you look at the right support infrastructures, if you get involved with the right programs and keep your eyes out, then you can get a lot of help to build your idea and shape it properly so that you can reach the market and actually have a great company built up. Uh, in which case, and here's Zhao uh, testing the drones, uh, it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for attending today. I think we've got some great panels coming up. And uh, I look forward to your questions. And back to you, Kim. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andy. If there's any questions, then please do put it in the chat box right now, or you can raise your hand by clicking the hand at the bottom of the screen. No? OK. If there's no questions for Andy, then he'll be around for the rest of the day, so you can speak to him in the social lounge if you've got anything that you think of during the session. Um, we're going to take a very, very short break while we bring up the other speakers onto the stage. And next up, we'll be back with Caroline, David and with James. We're going to give a quick overview of their experiences of developing technology companies within Bristol. We'll be back soon. Thanks so much.